literature in every way. It's just a, a absolutely fabulous piece, and I really look forward to to, share, to sharing it with you now. So I uh, just let Ruth in. How could we not have Ruth in to Vicky Lat Ruth and Rena is joining us. Uh, see if there's anyone else in the waiting room. No, that's well. Um, Ruth, you didn't hear me because you weren't in yet, but I said, how can we, how can we not have a root in our study of Megillat root? And in fact, it is a, um, Shavuot is my second daughter's birthday. She was born on Shavuot, but it is the name, the middle name of my third daughter, Sigal Ruth. Ah, Absolutely love it. So what I'm going to do is, um, I my daughter, I, but coincidentally, without even with non intentionally, unintentionally, yeah. my children are Leo Ruth, uh, Yehudit Nomi, and Yehonatan David. Oh, <laughs> fantastic! Our family's names are connected in general with Shaul, except the Sigal, because uh, my uh, late father-in-law was Shaul. And Sigal is, is Dafka, the only one that doesn't have a name that connects uh, directly with him, but her connection with Ruud, in fact, brings them all to royalty of some form or other. So, in fact, this is a beautiful way. I'm going to mute all of you and begin the study. And I'm going to ask, I hope that everybody has, um, has the uh, Megillah in front of them. And um, I'm no. not sure if you're going to unmute. Oh, no. You, you're not all muted. Well, let me go back again and make sure you are, because that's what was my intention. Mute all. Yes. Okay. And Rachel is coming. Lovely. Lovely to have Rachel joining us. Um, so we're going to, if you would now all uh, look at the text. Now, what I'm going to be probably concentrating, focusing on the text. So if you want to ask a question or contribute in any way, don't feel you have to wait for me to invite the, the uh, questions because I'm going to be so focused on the text that there's a strong possibility I won't notice your desire to contribute or, or um, ask something. So I'm in the text. I've got looking at both Hebrew and English and will join and will comment on both the Hebrew and the English, but you don't need the Hebrew version. So the text begins, and it's, uh, remember, it's, uh, there's only four chapters in this book. We can do it. The text begins, it came to pass in the days when the judges judged, and there was a famine in the land. And of course, many of the commentators straight away take this as a commentary on the time of the judges. Why is there famine in the land? Well, they're in Bet Lechem. Bet Lechem, although we understand it, and modern Hebrew says a house of bread, in the Aramaic, it's also possibly house of meat. That is, there's plenty of food, or there should be plenty of food. And there shouldn't be a famine in the land. Why do we have famines? Two reasons, and this is again, theologically, this is such an important concept. Either God can send a famine, but it doesn't say that. It can be human responsibility. And there are two aspects of the famine. First of all, the land of Israel is not like other lands. In other lands, humans cause a famine by mistreating the environment. And we can cause our own famines. We are responsible for what happens around us. Or the alternative is we cause a famine in the land. The famine in the land, as we just read in the parasha at the end of Sefer Vayikra, the threats. It's a warning that we're about to be expelled from the land if we don't do something differently. And the famine in the land is a divine warning to us. Change your ways or you're heading towards exile. And um, it can be seen as a criticism of the period of the judges, where the judges behaved badly and caused a famine in the land. And we are aware of the, of the if you like, the threat hanging over us um, that we might be expelled. So the whole book, this whole book of Ruth can be seen as critical of the judges and as establishing not just the uh, the uh, birth line of the king of David, David's family, but also the need for a king who will rule justly and fairly as opposed to the, the judges 
who weren't. So that's the, the first thing we note straight away. And then we see a man from Bethlehem of Judah went to sojourn in the fields of Moab. So again, we have more levels of criticism because if he's from the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Judah, which is going to become, as you know, the, the tribe of Dave, David, but Judah is already a, uh, an elevated tribe. He's a leader of the community. He's not just any person who's running away to support himself. In fact, it could be that he's running away from his responsibility. We understand him to be, and look at his name. We get him verse two, his name was Elimelech. It is a name of nobility. And we're told that going to Moab is um, a double, double sin, if you like. The first one is that you shouldn't leave the land of Israel anyway. And even though Abraham and uh, Jacob did leave the land in famine and Isaac headed out but was sent back, we are told that in both cases they sought permission from God to, to lead the land and God in fact set it up. But here we're not supposed to leave. He's not only running away from the responsibility of the land, he's running away from the, responsi the responsibility towards his community because he's supposed to be a leader. And Moab, Moab is the enemy. We're not allowed to intermarry with Moabites. We're about to see that question discussed in one moment. Notice his name, his name, as I said, Elimelech, um, dignity, no, no, dig a dignity, a name of uh, in indicating his his uh, nobility, and his wife's name is Nomi, which means pleasantness. But then if you've got such pleasant or noble names, look at the sons of their names, Machlon and Chilion, and they mean sickness, or Machala is, is sickness. There's other interpretations, but they're all negative interpretations of the names, horrible names, leading some of the commentators to say that they were, if you like, not their real names, but a form of nickname, which indicates their their, um, their tragedy to come, uh, horrible names. And they are, we're told again, I've emphasized the, uh, the nobility, Ephratites, they're from, they're Ephrati, Ephrati. they really are um, people that should have been able to stay. And so in verse three, no, uh, no uh, surprise here, Nomi's husband dies and she's left with her two sons. Why, as I say, no, no surprise here? Well, first of all, it's very quick. It's verse three. <laughs> but secondly, um, we can see that, some, that the story is being set up. Something's wrong. Now, um, one of the things that if we had several hours to look at this text that I would ask you to consider is whether Nomi had any say in this. The text doesn't indicate. It may have been that she didn't want to leave. And now she finds herself left with her two sons. They marry Moabite women. So is this not a sin? Is it not explicitly prohibited? One of the commentaries on the reason for the book of Ruth, amongst the reasons for writing the book of Ruth, is to show that that only applied to Moabite men. We're not allowed to marry Moabite men. We are allowed to marry Moabite women. Um, again, continuing this, this question, why not who were they? Who were the Moabites? Well, first of all, the name Moab comes from Me'av, from the father, and it's the story of Lot and his daughters. Lot was um, Lot and his daughters ran away from Stom, and they truly believed that they were the only people left alive in the world, and they had to restart civilization. So the, the daughters got their father drunk, they slept with him, and each of them conceived. And the Moabites then were our relatives, descendants of Lot. But when the Jewish people are returning from Egypt to the promised land, the Moabites would not let them through, would not let them pass. And so they became our enemies. Um, and we were told that we couldn't marry um, with, the, with the Moabites. Um, and the names again, what is Orpa? Orpa is perhaps, it could be related to the back of her neck, the back of the neck. And um, there's all sorts of interpretations about what that might mean. And we're going to see the back of her, her neck. She's going to leave. But the other is Ruth. What is the name Ruth? And um, we have Ruth online with us. Ruth is Tor backwards, Torah backwards. So maybe Ruth was always destined 
to be linked up with Torah. That's one of the, of the answers. And um, it says, it's interesting, they dwelt there for about 10 years. That's a long time to stay three women together. And um, it so it shows a certain loyalty to Nomi there in the land that they stayed with her because they are after all Moabite women and they could have returned to her to their families. It's also interesting why Ruth, uh, Nomi doesn't make the move back earlier. Nevertheless, um, sorry, uh, sorry, that they're 10 years, I wipe that, it's recorded so we can't. <laughs> they stay 10 years, but they do not have children there. But it still raises the question of why um, they don't, uh, Nomi, when her husband dies, doesn't bring them back and why Maklon and Chilion don't want to come back to the land. Verse six, she arose with her daughters-in-law and returned from the fields of Moab, for she had heard in the field of Moab that the Lord had remembered his people to give them bread, the lechem, bet lechem. So she hears in, in um, Moab that the famine is over in the land and again raises questions, why did she wait that long to return? It might be that her sons had decided they'd become so assimilated, they wanted to stay. It could be that her sons were the ones that said, we have to wait till the famine is over. There's so many questions and so many possibilities in the text, but she is going to start back now to return. First of all, no grandchildren, no sons, no living, living um, blood relatives, but two daughters-in-law. And they start on the road. And again, it should remind you of another story. When Abraham is first told, Lech Lecha, go, he has already started on the road. And we have this in the, in the Tanakh, this uh, pattern of on the road, you don't necessarily do it in one step. She'd started on the return journey. And then we get the continuation now of, of the story of her return. And Nomi turns, verse eight, she says, go return each woman to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as dealt with your deceased and with me. And again, I, I think it's a very interesting female story. She doesn't say return to your father's house. She says return to your mother's house. It's, it's interesting choice of language. And may you find rest each woman in her husband's, that you find woman, rest each woman in her husband's house, suggesting that they should remarry. And they raised their voices and wept. They didn't want to be separated from Nomi. And they said to her, no, but we will return with you to your people. Both of them are saying that. And Nomi said, return my daughters, why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they should be your husbands? Reminding us of a theme we're going to see later in the story, the story of the Leverite marriage, meaning were Nomi to have another son, it would be that son's duty to marry childless widows from his brothers. But she says, I'm not going to give you another son and you should have children. Um, so, and, it, and then she says, but even, you know, should I remarry hypothetically and I would have another child, he'd be much too young for you. So it's much better um, to go. And, and in verse 13, she says, it's much more bitter for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone against me. And perhaps Naomi has seen that the loss of her husband and then the loss of her sons and the absence of grandchildren is punishment punishment because perhaps she should have made the decision never to leave the land of Israel. They wept, they raised their voices, and we see the back of Orpah's head. She kisses her mother-in-law goodbye and says goodbye, but Ruth says no. And Nomi, and, um, Nomi says to her, go after your sister-in-law. And Ruth says in verse 16, this fantastic line, and I'm going to read it slowly, verse 16. And Ruth said, do not entreat me to leave you. And it continues that, and by the way, into, into 17. To return from following you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. 
Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. So may the Lord do to me and so may he continue if anything but death separate you and me. Incredible lines. Um, you know, we always say may, till death do us part refers to marriage. But here, Ruth is making herself a life bond with Nomi. And I want us to analyze because this is what converts say when they join our people. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my God. If my people, your God, my God, wherever you die, I will die. I want to take each of these parts one by one. The first one is wherever you go, I will go. One answer, uh, one comment here is the word telchi, uh, where, where you go, I will go. The word telchi can relate to the concept of halacha, going. It could relate to the idea that I'm going to accept your laws. And then that is why wherever you lodge, I will lodge, meaning physically I will be with you, can be seen as a separate uh, statement. Because if it was wherever you go, I go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge, um, were, were both about physical place. And that would be unlike the Tanakh, which doesn't waste words. So I don't think they're about physical place. The first one is about following a lifestyle and only the second one is about physical space. And then your people will be my people and only then your God, my God. And here I always share a story which I'm going to share very quickly with you today because we're going to race through this so quickly is the story that my dear friend and I, um, I don't think he'll mind me sharing no, I won't mention his name. A friend of mine who um, was found himself saying Kaddish in, an, in a uh, community that he didn't know. And he noticed there was a particular man who, who attended the shul um, regularly and was never given an aliyah. So one day he decided to ask about this guy who never got an aliyah. And they said, oh, he's not Jewish. He said, what? He comes to, to Daphne every day. He wears filling, you know. How come he's not Jewish? He said, the Beth Din won't convert him. And they said, why won't the Beth Din convert him? He said, because every time he is asked why he wants to convert, he gives the same answer. And his answer is because God told me. And of course, the answer has to be, I want to be part of the Jewish people. You can't, it's in, in Judaism, if God tells you to do something, so then you can be a, bene, a Ben Noah, then you can be somebody who follows God's laws but you have to want to be part of the people. And this is what Nomi understood. And she also understood, as we see in the next um, verse, that it's for life. You don't join the pe Jewish people and then opt out. And that also reminds me when I was studying sociology in university and I forgot to do my major paper. So the, because it was sociology was so slack in those days, I forgot to do my major paper. So the, the, the lecturer said, oh, well, you can pass if you just do a, a little study of something. So I, I did a quick study of one of the cults that was around at the time in the 60s. And the, the whole thing about the cult is, oh, try us for a week or two. If you don't like it, you can leave. Of course, they didn't really want people to leave. But the point was the idea in religion, try us, dip your toe in, that's okay. Ruth understood for the Jewish people, it doesn't work that way. We don't have people dropping in and dropping out. If you join our people, you join them forever. And Ruth understood all of that instinctively. So when, uh, verse 18, so when Ruth saw that she was determined, uh, when Nomi saw she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. In other words, she stopped arguing with her. But I don't think they stopped speaking, although some of the best communication and greatest communication can occur in silence. And especially as Ruth has said, where you go, I will go. I imagine Nomi becomes like a rebbe to Ruth. She, does, she learns best by just following her, by doing what she does. And they went on until they arrived in Bethlehem. And it came to arrive in Bethlehem that the entire city was, and it says was a stir, my, my translation says a stir on their account. Uh, the commentator say, Rashi says that the wife of Boaz, his first wife, has died that day. And they're all, the whole city is out at the funeral honoring Boaz's first wife. But whatever it is, they're all out there. And they all are stern. They say, is this Nomi? And... Um, when I look at this 
through bibliodrama and have the whole city out there looking, I can imagine them seeing two women in a distance. And it could be that they're asking whether Ruth is Nomi, the younger one, because when she left Nomi pleasantness, she had energy, she was young. Um, and then she comes back and there's a young woman and an old woman. And perhaps they're asking, is that young woman, is that Nomi? But of course, it's the old woman who's Nomi. And she says, don't call me Nomi, call me Mara, for the old, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Call me Mara. Call, don't call me pleasant, call me bitter. And verse 21, a very a, a tragic, very moving line. I went away full and the Lord's brought me back empty. So why should you call me Nomi, seeing that the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty dealt harshly with me? And notice how verse 22, the language here, the Tashav Nomi, the word Chuva, return, of course, has implications beyond physically returning. She returned, but she's with Ruth, and Ruth is described here as a Moabitess in my language, Moabite. Um, she's her daughter-in-law, she's with her. She's returned from the fields of Moab and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. One of the questions that's asked is why is this um, red on Shavuot? And one of the many answers, and I got much better answers than this, but one of them is exactly this, this timing that it's the beginning of the barley harvest. So that's where we are at the end of chapter one. Excuse me, but the barley is at Pesach. Yeah, but it's but only the, later when the wheat when she gets the wheat that that it's uh, yeah okay. expands the period from the barley harvest to the wheat harvest is exactly the period that the story spans, which is Spirata Omer, and therefore that that so it's one of the answers given as to why we read it on Shavuot. But yes, thanks, thanks. Um, so we're on to chapter two now. Nomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of valor, um, Ish Gibor Chayil. And of course, we are used to Eshet Chayil. So we know that the word Gibor is the word that might refer to physical prowess. And Chayil is might of a different sort, because it's also, as I say, ascribed to women. So both words are written there. Um, and in fact, if you look at it closely in your Hebrew, uh, you will see that Nomi had a kinsman of her husband, Le'isha, to her husband. But of course, it's Isha Ish. It's it's very interesting double use of the same root, um, and there's a lot that can be said about this idea of who he was as a man. But his name was Boaz, which gives us three words associated with strength in the same sentence. So not only does the word ish repeat itself, and again, maybe I'll take you right back to the beginning. Naomi modal isha. Look at the the um, lang the, the it's very unusual language and repetition of certain letters. Nomi. Moda, you've got the mem and the ayin, then you've got ish, isha, ish, double word. Now we have gibor, chayil, and we get to the, his name, boaz. Az is also, or oz is strength. So it's a very, it's, it's really praising and emphasizing the unusual qualities of this man. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Nomi, I'll go to the field, I'll glean among the grain. Notice here it seems that um, Ruth has initiated the, um, this, this idea of going to glean, but she comes, sorry, I'm just going to um, mute you all. She comes to the, to the field of Boaz by chance. So again, look at the, the structure of the way the story is told. We are told, we're given a, a lot of detail, a lot of words about this kinsman whose name is Boaz. Then we get almost a side story. Ruth says to him, I better go and glean because you need we need some grain and she's given permission. And then we have verse three that she chance comes across Boaz 
who was of the family of Elimelech. Um, we just learned in verse one that he was the family of Elimelech, but it's to emphasize that this story is not just, it's not just by chance. Everything is set up in this story. And um, this idea of gleaning in the field, first of all, we are told, we, we're about to see that Boaz is very generous and fastidious about making sure that his gleaners have whatever they need. And, um, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, may the Lord be with you. And they said to him, the Lord bless you. I remember that um, one of the um, nice, Stories that we have here. Vehine Boaz bami bet lechem veyomale kotsrim Hashem emichem v'miu lo yevarechah Hashem. That what remember that um, in uh, this week's parsha we read yevarechah Hashem, the priestly blessing. So there's a there's always a lovely timer, a uh, timing there of reading this story around the time when we learn of the origin. But it's a very nice idea that he comes and greets his reapers, it says something about the man that he goes out and greets the reapers in his field. And he says, he sees this woman in the distance and he says, who does, whose woman is she? Where does this woman come from? And um, there's, a, there's a discussion about why she, the commentators have lovely discussion about why she stands out. One answer is she just happened to be tall. So she stood out because she was tall. But the another answer that's given is, she was very modest so that when she bent down to glean, she um, crouched down in a very modest way, just didn't bend over. So that's another answer about her modesty coming out. We're going to need to know about her modesty as we know as the story goes on. And they answer and they keep emphasizing her Moabite. Remember, she's described as a Moabite over and over again. They keep emphasizing her Moabite origins here as if to say she's not um, really an available woman here. She's not somebody that we can, can look at as a potential wife or even to match with another gleaner because she's a Moabite. It just keeps going over and over again. And, and she said, uh, and, and, and she said, I will now glean and gather from among the sheaves after the reapers. And she stood even till morning until now, except when she sat a little. So they describe her energy in gleaning. Verse eight, Boaz said to Ruth, have you not heard my daughter? Do not go glean in another field. Neither shall you go away from here. Here you shall stay with my maidens. Your eyes shall be on the field that they reap and follow them. In other words, what he's saying to her, Listen, it's all set up very nicely here. You're, you might be a Moabite, and this is what he's heard so far is that she's in the Moabite that came with um, Nomi, but um, she's, not, she's a stranger, she doesn't know the way, and he takes care and says to her, um, listen, follow my other gleaners, they'll show you how to get the best results, and you can have water. And in verse 10, she says, how come you're being so nice to me? And she uses the word, va'anochi nochria. I'm a nochria. Nochria is an utter stranger, not a ger, not a stranger who's residing within our gates, but an utter stranger, a nochri. And Boaz replied and said to her, I've heard, it's been told to me what you did for your mother-in-law and you've come to support Naomi. I'm may the Lord reward your deeds and, and I'm going to make sure. And notice in verse 12, he says, you've taken shelter under God's wings, but I'm going to make sure that, that I fulfill it. And it goes back to chapter one. In chapter one, it looked like the people had not appreciated that they need to do God's will, the partnership between God and the people to make the land flourish. And Boaz is standing out here as somebody who does realize that, that if God said something up, he's got a responsibility to make it happen. And she responds, and in verse 14, they eat bread and dip your morsel in vinegar. Long story, um, but dipping in vinegar is probably the origin of haroset, or certainly dipping at Pesach. Um, anyway, she rose to glean, and Boaz gives his... his um, his uh, reapers um, an order 
and says, let her glean also amongst the sheaves, don't embarrass her, and also forget, leave some bundles for her, this concept of shechecha, leave the, what you forget in the field, you can't go back and don't scold her. And she gets a lot of, of goods. Verse 19, she gets home to Nomi and Nomi said to her, where have you gleaned? Where have you worked? She says, I worked with Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he, the Lord, who did not leave off his kindness with the living or the deceased. That man is our kinsman. He's our near kinsman. So Naomi recognizes God's hand in making sure that the fields that she gleaned in were Boaz's. And Ruth the Moabitess said, he said to me, you shall stay with me until I finish the harvest. And he says, it's really good. And she stayed um, and till the wheat harvest. This is what we said that between the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. We're up to chapter three. And Nomi, her mother-in-law said to her, now note, we've been talking about Ruth the Moabites, but not Moab, Moabites, and now we get different language, if you like, because Nomi, her mother-in-law, she's feeling maternal towards her. Um, my daughter, shall I not rest that it be, shall I not seek rest for you that it be good for you? I can't, I have to worry about you as well as you've been worrying about me. And now is not Boaz our kinsman in whose maidens you were? Behold, he's winnowing on the flesh floor of the barley tonight. I happen to know that we've reached the, the time for the winnowing. And um, I'm going to make a suggestion to you. She says, you shall bathe anoint yourself, put your clothes on, go to the threshing floor, do not make yourself known to the man who till he's finished eating and drinking. And when he comes, you shall lie down where he shall lie down and cover his feet, lie down and he'll tell you what to do. And she says, Ruth says, I'll do what you say to me. Now, this is a very controversial and if you like difficult piece and commentators have a lot to say about it because was Nomi suggesting something indecent or improper, God forbid. Even the, the commentators even comment on the clothes, put on, put on your clothes, that they say that what Nomi's meaning is that she should go out in her normal um, gleaning clothes and should modestly change so that she's not wearing the clothes. So, so first of all, she's not wearing unsuitable clothing for gleaning and she's also not wearing... Um, clothes that she's worked in later on, you know, even the changing, they have a lot to say about. But when she says lie down, uncover his feet and lie down, he'll tell you what to do. The commentators make a big point of saying, she says uncover your feet to make sure that she doesn't, I think she should uncover anything else. And in fact, what does uncover his feet mean? What, what again, many of the commentators say is that's to remind him of the whole Leverite marriage responsibility. He is the nearest kinsman and this, the whole act is done by um, taking off your shoes. So it is seen, uh, uh, this is seen as, uh, or the commentators emphasize, there's nothing immodest going on here. So verse six, she went to the threshing floor, did all that her mother-in-law told, Boaz ate and drank, his heart was merry, he went to lie at the end of the stack, she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down near his feet. And it came to pass at midnight that the man quaked and was taken around and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? I'm Ruth. Um, you shall spread your skirt over your handmaiden for you are a near kinsman. Again, not to suggest that she should uh, put her her um, anything other than than what is proper. The skirt of your garment cover me with your cloak, uh, your cloak, not what he's wearing now. And it can indicate marriage. How many of you have been to a wedding ceremony? We're in the wedding ceremony. The groom puts his new tabit, this is Safadi custom, over his bride, that's his cloak over his bride, connoting marriage. So she might be saying to him, not, you know, let's go to bed together, but God forbid, but rather either the cloak that you took off, the work, the, the work cloak, you know, you can 
you can spread over me as a sign of, in a way, perhaps your ownership for me, but probably a better comment, Rashi's commentary, you should marry me because you have to um, redeem me. You're the closest kinsman. And he said, I'm in verse 10, may you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. May you be blessed. Your latest act of kindness is greater than the first, not to follow the men, whether you're rich or poor. What does it mean your, greater act, your latest act of kindness is greater than the first? Rashi said, you've been so kind to Nomi. You've looked after her. You've gleaned for her. You've supported her. You've stayed with her. And now you're being really kind to me. I'm an old man. And you chose not to follow the young man, men, but rather to offer me the first chance at, at marrying you. That is a great deed of kindness, says Boaz. And he says, now I'm going to do it. I'm going to try the redemption process. But if you look at it, look at the Hebrew in Yud Bet in 12. The Ata ki omnam ki goelanachi. Omnam ki, despite the fact there's, a, there's some doubt in it, says Rashi. That, that, but what's the doubt? The doubt is, am I actually the closest kinsman? And it's not, Rashi says, this is not doubt about whether he wants to marry her. He wants to marry her, but he's doubt whether he'll be able to marry her. So um, what, what he, he wants to, he wants to make it happen. Verse 13, stay overnight, come to pass in the morning that if I redeem you, then I'll redeem you. And, da, 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 and, and you stay here, stay overnight. Stay overnight is also hidden language of don't marry anyone else or go and get, don't get yourself betrothed to anyone else because I'm going to um, solve this problem. She lay at his feet until morning, rose as one could do to recognize his fellow. Da, 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 da. Let it not be known, says, let it, that the woman came to the threshing floor. Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. She do, doesn't want there to be any bad rumors going around. So he says, ready the shawl you're wearing and hold it. And she gives, he gives her six measures of barley. Um, and she carried a very heavy load. Um, that, again, the Midrash says, it's not about six measures of barley, really, because that would have been too heavy for her to, to carry. So it couldn't be that. So it must be six blessings are destined to come from her. It has to be symbolic language about blessings rather than measures of barley. And again, if I rem remind you, when we count the Omer nowadays, we don't count out measures of, of grain. The concept of counting out measures of grain is as a metaphor for counting out something greater and a blessing. And that's how that verse is read. And she came to her mother-in-law, verse 16, and said, who are you, my daughter? <laughs> what does that mean? Who are you, my daughter? And he noticed the first of all, the language of my daughter, but also it's a, it's a very interesting question, who are you? And she said, he gave me these six barleys, but he said, do not come empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And she said, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will fall. The man will not rest to resolve the matter. In other words, Nomi has absolute confidence after seeing the barley that she's seen the message, that she understands what's going on and that he's not, she's not brought food this time. She's brought blessings and the blessings are a promise to, of the future. So now we get the story that Boaz went, and went up to the gate and sat down there. Um, remember, this is still the time of the judges. We haven't got to the period of the kings yet. And the judges used to sit at the gate. And um, the, the, it turns out that this, this relative happens to be passing. Well, of course, he goes to the gate and he knows the relative will pass. And he says to him, uh, come and sit down. And what's interesting is his name doesn't appear. He's called Poloni. He's, he's called just a, an, a, a person. And 
remember I pointed out to you how much detail, how much effort there is to go into describing Boaz. And this is contrasted by how much effort there is to go, gone into to not describing this person, to keep him completely out of the story. Um, it's a, it, there's, a, there's an element that his identity is hidden here. We shouldn't know anything about him. And verse 2, Boaz, this is, took 10 men of the city, said, sit down, there's got to be a Beth Din here. Now, you would only need three people to witness uh, or to make a judgment, but he wants 10. 10 is a full minyam. In certain complicated legal cases, you have to move from three to 10. And if you remember in Shiva brachas and a wedding, you should have 10 people for the full Shiva brachas. So he wants to go, he wants to cover whatever the consequences may be, even the possibility of having the wedding right. Now he's going to make sure that he's all ready. 10 of them. And he says, you know that this Nomi, he's returned from the field and um, there's a portion, there's something involved, a portion of the field belonging to Eli, Eli Of course, the portion of the field, <laughs> the redeeming of the field comes along with the Leverite responsibility. He says, um, I want you to know that that you could do it. And, and uh, he says, I'll do it, but there's, you need to understand, says Boaz, yeah, there's a problem. There's a there's a hitch. Uh, what's the word? Uh, um, I can't remember the expression. But you know, it, there's a there's a hidden uh, uh, hitch. If you buy the land, you also get. The... Sorry. What did somebody say? A codicil. Yeah, so there's a, it could be a codicil. That wasn't the expression I was thinking of, but that'll do. You know, you get the land, you also get the woman, and um, you'll have to marry her. And he says, I don't. I, I don't want that. And there's again, there's a, a, a questions are asked because we don't know anything about this man. Was he saying because he already has a wife and she would be jealous? Is it because she's a Moabite? Um, we don't know. And all these are possibilities of why he says, I don't want to. But it could be that he already has a wife and he already has children. Now, the point of the Leverite marriage is that she should be able to have children that she didn't have with her first husband. If he is worried about having to split his inheritance with children of this woman who are Moabite, you know, we don't want anything to do with them. I don't want to, to, to have anything to do with it. It's quite possible. Um, Anyway, it, the, the Torah, the, the Tanakh now goes and, and gives us this, this verse 7, and it says, now it was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redemption and exchange to confirm anything one, one would remove his shoe and give it to his fellow, and this was the attestation in Israel. So we get the, the, the clarity here that the removing of the shoe is going to be confirmation that a deal has been made. And it may go back to Ruth's hint to Boaz the night before about uh, uncovering his feet, reminding him of the shoe. Um, anyway, the and the kinsman said to Boaz, verse 8, buy it for yourself, and he removed his shoe. And Boaz said to the elders of the entire people, you are witnesses that today I've bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion and Machlon's from Naomi and also Ruth the Moabites, Machlon's wife, I've acquired for myself for a wife to preserve the name of the de deceased on his heritage so that the name of the deceased not be obliterated from his brethren and from the gate of the place, your witnesses today. It's all happening. And all the people who are in the gate and the elders replied, we are witnesses. May the Lord... Make the woman who's entering your house like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built up the house of Israel and prosper in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. There's so much to say about the fact that, that where, are they, where is this taking place? It's taking place in the place where Rachel is, um, is buried. And, but it says Rachel and Leah, and they built up houses. This is a blessing for Children. Now, remember, I've said it already, Boaz is an old man, and um, he, we don't have indications that he has other children, and they, they go on with the blessing. 
And they say, may your house be like the house of Peretz, whom Tamar brought to Judah with the seed that the Lord will give you from this maiden. Now, I want to remind you, because this is a fascinating story. We are getting the story of Ruth, who is a, this is a Leverite marriage. In other words, Boaz is marrying her out of a sense, a voluntary sense of obligation. It seems that there's love as well. I mean, he, see, he sees something in her as well, but he's voluntarily taking on the obligation to look after his relative's widowed, childless woman. What is the story of Judah and Tamar? Judah didn't want to give Tamar his next son after three of his sons who were married to her have already perished and she's still childless. He doesn't want to give the next son to her. And she has to trick Judah himself into marrying her. And it is seen to her credit, to her virtue, that she is enforcing, forcing him to do what he should have done voluntarily. And from this seed comes the house of Judah, of which Boaz is one. So what is going on here is a form of tikkun. What Judah should have done voluntarily, Boaz is now doing voluntarily but he's doing it with root, a Moabite test, if you like. But um, we learn that Boaz understood that the ban on intermarrying with the Moabites was against the men only and not the women. And root was some sort of exceptional character who had fully become part of the people. And he was realizing what in a sense had already happened that she's already part of the people and now she needs to be married and able to have children to, because how do we really become part of a community when the next generation are part of that community? So Boaz takes Ruth, she becomes his wife, he's intimate with her and God gave her conception and she bore a son. And the women said to Nomi, Blessed is the Lord who did not deprive you of a redeemer today and may his name be famous in Israel and may it be to you a, a restorer of life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you bore him and she's better to you than seven sons and Nomi took the child, became his nurse and the women gave him a name and said a son has been born to Nomi. Now I, again, this is a fascinating little um, side comment, but maybe it's more significant than the side comment. And the women neighbors gave him a name. Who's supposed to name a child? Usually it's the parents. It's interesting that if you look at what happens in the uh, Torah, it is usually, the, it's often, not usually, very, very often the mothers, going even back to the very first children born in the Torah, it is Eve who names her sons, Cain and Abel. Rachel and Leah name their children. And remember, we've just been told that the blessing given was that she should be like Rachel and Leah. And Leah, and Leah who, they name their children, not the father, but in later generations, the father would name the children at the Brit, but here the women neighbors gave him the name and they called his name Oved. And Oved is a very interesting name because Oved, what does it mean Oved? It can mean worker. It can be a, a name of somebody who works, but we usually use the word Oved to mean someone who is Avodat Hashem, praying to Hashem somebody who is subservient to God. And I want to come back to the subservience in one minute. And so then it gives the, um, it's, so first it says, they called his name Oved. He's the father of Yeshai, the father of David. Now, obviously, this is, if you like, an editorial comment because it, the, the, the women neighbors who gave him the name have no idea what his future is going to be. But the text continues and it goes backwards again. These are the generations of Peretz. Peretz begot 
Hezron. So what they do is they, they go back and they've just done what happens from Ruth onwards, that they are going to go back to what happened from Judah and Tamar onwards. So we have this double linking back to these women who set up their place in the Jewish community correctly through insisting that men honour their obligations in terms of the Neverite marriage. So it's a really interesting, if you like, conclusion that the book comes to. What does the book come to remind? The last word in, in uh, the book of Ruth, in Megillat Ruth, is David, Bolid et David. So if the book starts off by saying it was in the time of the judges and there was famine in the land, the book finishes with saying all of this is going to lead us to the house of David. And the book can be seen as, in fact, designed, dedicated to telling the story of the origins of David. And that it, the David is conceived in a very... Um, uh, an atmosphere where it's all good, that Ruth is an exemplifier of doing chesed, the way she looks after Nomi, and Boaz is also an exemplifier of chesed, the way he looks after Ruth. So we have both ancestors of David here being described in, in, in glowing terms, in terms of their chesed, and kindness, and that's that is the background to David. But the book is also careful to tell us the other side, which is the story of Tamar and Judah. It's inserted in there. It's not necessary for the story to go backwards, but they do go backwards. And and there's a question: Are we suggesting that I mentioned already the idea of this is a sort of tikkun for that story, a correction for that story when Judah wasn't really ready to do it? But it can also be that that the two women in the background, Tamar is, uh, is also being um, praised in this, um, in this narrative that we're getting here. So, it, so one reason why we read this book on Shavuot can be to place everything that we've, the, the reception of the Torah, everything we've been thinking about on Shavuot to link it to the house of David, to make this a story about how we were destined to move from judges to kings. And this is a story of the background of David. I don't really see that as the key story, but I think it's a, a, a nice one. The other one that we mentioned already is the setting, the rural setting, the harvest festival um, between the barley and the wheat and the counting of the Omer, all of that. I've mentioned kindness and chesed as a theme, but I want to share with you what I love about the story and find so powerful and think is the true linking of this story to Shavuot. And it goes back to chapter two when we saw Ruth agree, uh, sorry, is it chapter one or two, I bet, right at the beginning of the story when Ruth says to, to um, Naomi, where you go, I will go. Because we also have noted already, we've noted the transition of the way Ruth is described. We do sometimes go back to, um, we, we sometimes go back to hearing Ruth described as a Moabite. But by the end of the book, she's not a Moabite anymore. She is fully integrated into the lives of the people. We see in the book, the concept that she describes herself as a Nochria a complete stranger. And Boaz says, no, you're not a complete stranger. You're part of my household. I'm bringing you in to my household. Root understands that what it is to take on Torah and what it is to take on Torah is not about saying I have a relationship with God. Taking on Torah is about saying I have a relationship with the Jewish people. And sometimes it can start off with a Jewish person. And that 
attraction, that desire to be part of that person's community. You know that there's a huge debate in Jewish life about who, who is eligible for conversion. And one of the groups that have traditionally been rejected are people who have decided they want to marry a Jew so they convert in order to marry that, or they want to convert in order to marry that Jew. And there has historically been debate amongst the Rabbonim, whether that's good or bad, with Sephardi Rabbonim often saying, but that's good. That's what we want. Because the person who wants to marry a Jew wants to join our people, and particularly, I need to add, in Israel. Because they want to be part of a, it's a little bit different in Gola, in diaspora, where they can be attracted as a couple away from Jewish culture. But here, the idea and the Sephardim, many of the Sephardim Rabbonim have taken quite a positive view for somebody who wants to marry a Jew in that they want to be part of the people. But even more than that, the idea that they want to be, uh, so even more than marriage, the idea of understanding where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge, a preliminary to your God will be my God. Wanting to be part of the Jewish people is the true sign of understanding what it is to be Jewish. And now I'll add the other layer, the final layer, if you like, of my presentation, and then lovely, I would love to hear more comments from you. And that is, I mentioned that Ruth's name could be seen as Ruth Tor, Torah, backwards, that she was always destined to Torah. What does Ruth understand about receiving Torah? She understands that it's completely voluntary. Nomi says to her, go back to your mother-in-law. And she says, I won't go back. What does it, it, this voluntary nature of accepting Torah, and the first thing she says is, where you go, I will go, which, as I said, can be interpreted as accepting halacha, accepting law, accepting that where you go, I will go, is a bond. And remember, the baby that's born to her is called Oved, a subject. He has voluntarily subjected himself to Torah. And this is the essence of the meaning of Shavuot. Why is Shavuot called Matan Torah, the giving of Torah? and not Kabbalat Torah, the receiving of Torah. It, God gives it, but there cannot be a time or a date in which we say we accept it because every individual has to take on Ol Malchut Shamayim, the, the burden or the understanding of, of serving, of Oved, of taking on Torah, each individual in their own time and in their own way. That's what Ruth did. She understood it was completely voluntary. And I think that's why we read the story on Shavuot. And it also ties in with the fact that Shavuot is not given a date in the Torah. Because if it were given a date, it would be as if on that date that God appeared and gave Torah, suddenly everybody accepted it. I don't think that's the way it is. We, we all go through a process. Some of us are, are lucky enough to go through the process in childhood. And in adulthood, it's taken for granted that we've accepted Torah. But most of us continue to work through that process. Maybe most of us can't even ever give a time that we say we've accepted Torah. But Ruth could. She understood the idea of voluntary acceptance. And I think that's a beautiful idea to read on Shavuot. So now I'd love to hear comments on any of that, uh, questions, comments on any, anything to do with the book. Oh. Okay. Hannah, yes. Um, let's see, am I unmuted? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I had also learned maybe similar to your conclusion that um, that we read it at this time because um, right before giving of the Torah, I mean, no one was a uh, Jew yet. And so everyone was a convert. So uh, yeah. symbolizing that, you know, that everyone well, was- I'd love, to, I'd love to pick up on that on two levels. The first one is that I, um, they used to describe Jews, converts as Jews by choice. That was the definition of a, of a convert. And in fact, in the Talmud, they, they, are very, they give a lot of praise to the convert saying, um, 
he's more worthy than somebody who's born a Jew. And, but I've heard many people say that in the 20th and 21st centuries, for the first time in history, anyone who stays a Jew is a Jew by choice. Because in the um, previous generations, people forced you to be Jews. Now people don't force you. You can choose. The second thing I want to say is a lovely saying when we receive the Torah, it says, say to Bet Yaakov and Bnei Yisrael. And that's why do we need both terms, Bet Yaakov and Bnei Yisrael? And one answer is that Bet Yaakov refers to the women and Bnei Yisrael refers to the men. But another uh, commentary on that says that Bet Yaakov, the people just happen to be born, they just happen to be descendants of Jacob. That Bnei Yisrael means they've struggled with God, that they, are, that they, they understand what it is to have that heritage. And again, this, this is, it follows on exactly from what you've just said, kind of this idea that we all have to move from being Jacob to being Yisrael. It's a, it's a struggle to move. So we have, may have been um, uh, Bet Yaakov, but we may not have been yet B'nai Yisrael. We may not have done the struggle. And, and Ruth does the struggle. She isn't Bet Yaakov. She isn't born into it, but she understands being B'nai Yisrael, being a child of struggling with God. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions? Well, I find it a beautiful book and I hope, did, Rachel, did you want to say something? I'll unmute you. Rachel, you're, you're not unmuted. I'm just trying to unmute you and not succeeding. Wait, can let me keep trying. Rachel, can you try? Ah, there you go. Yeah. No, I was saying, I think Rosalind was going to say, was saying something and uh -huh. she's, you're muted, Rosalind. I'll try and mute Rosalind. Oh. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Oh, but you're Chicago, mm. thank you. It was okay. brilliant. Thank you. Roz, yes. Roz, you're unmuted. Oh, I was just going to make a, a small comment. It was interesting that the Brit of my great grandson was this past Thursday. And mm. the, the name that they chose was a big question in my head as to why he chose this name. He chose the name David. And when, in reading this, I, I had forgotten that, you know, what the, the last lines of the Mugilat um, Torah, because we have a number of Davids in our family. So it's just, it was curious to me. So you explained the whole thing to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's tied into Shabbat. Lovely. Yeah. No, I realized why, because he, he also chose the name with, the, with, the, with his Rav, you know, in their tradition. You know, to to have a, a list of names and then the Rav chooses. So uh, it was uh, curious to me that that he chose to be. But I no, just <laughs> Shabu, was sharing, just Shabu. sharing that. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. I I love the, your commentary. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, in that case, I'm going to. Oh, Nancy. Yes, let's unmute Nancy. Just a minute. There you go. You're unmuted, Nancy. I I really appreciate today. It was just. You were fantastic. So, <laughs> yeah. so unlike it's, it's it's very it, it it's a very um, easy story to tell. And by the way, to do as bibliodrama, it's also just beautiful because there are so many options as to what's yeah. going on in people's heads when all of this is happening, including the townsfolk. The, the, the it's it's a great story because in so many of the texts. We don't get the mention of the people around. And in this case, they are in the beginning, they're in the middle and in the end. The people are part of the story, which is lovely. So everybody, Chag Sameach. I'll see some of you. Chag Sameach. I'll see Chag Sameach, everyone. Mazal Tov with the baby. That's great. <laughs>